Yeah, marketing should be fun. Yeah. We're, we're, we're the fun part of business. That's why my students major in marketing. They don't want to have to do the, the hard work that the, that the finance people do. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples. Not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz. Real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. Here is the hardest thing for me in marketing and probably in life. It's understanding, truly understanding other people. I work to really understand the people closest to me, my wife, my kids, and it is so many levels harder to understand people who may be very different than me, like customers, if I'm engaged in copywriting, or even you, the listener of this podcast. How can I best serve you? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Anyway, if you face a similar challenge, lend us your ears for the next 30 minutes or so. We're going to discuss unconventional sources of customer data, interacting with real customers when you're developing a new product, getting frequent reality checks from your customers, plus keys to your marketing career like the strength of weak ties, finding collaborators with complementary skill sets, and always being vigilant about updating your assumptions. With our guest today, joining me is Dr. Michael Solomon, Professor of Marketing at St. Joseph's University. Thanks for joining us today, Michael. Hey, Daniel. Thanks so much for having me on. So I'm just going to go through your LinkedIn real quick to give people a, a, a background of where you're from. You started undergrad at Brandeis with a BA in psychology. You went on to get your PhD in social psychology from UNC Chapel Hill. You're author of textbooks on principle of marketing, consumer behavior, introduction to business and social media marketing. You're a contributor to Forbes, a lot here. And your new book is called The New Chameleons, How to Connect with Consumers Who Defy Categorization. As a, and a, as I mentioned, you are the professor of marketing at St. Joseph's University. So we're going to get into a lot of interesting stories from your career. First, just kind of give us a brief understanding of what you're doing right now. Well, right now, I'm really focused on customer engagement and the big problems that that poses. The uh, pandemic, of course, hasn't helped with that. But uh, you know that that's probably the biggest challenge many of us face today is is just getting our customers' attention because <clears throat> because as as you uh, as you observe you know there's so many different people and companies out there that are jockeying for our attention it really is a challenge for a marketer just to get heard so I'm I'm focusing on uh, actually recently developed an online course. Uh, using psychological principles to to help your customers to stay engaged and focus on on what you're doing. And uh, once you have that focus, there's no guarantee you'll make a sale. But if you don't have it, you're certainly not going to go anywhere. So it, it's a it's a big problem, and it's uh, very interesting. Of course, with the pandemic, uh, you know that that's thrown another wrinkle into things and made it even more challenging for everyone. Yeah, I made it harder to learn about customers because we're not maybe seeing them as much. We're not if, if we're in B two B, we're not going to events and seeing them. If we're B two C, not being able to like go to a store and listen to your customers. But here's here's a really interesting story you shared with me kind of in the pre interview, where you're working with Levi Strauss and you're trying to understand the psychology of blue jeans, which you know I guess has a psychology. I hadn't really thought of that. So how did you do that? How did you try to better understand yeah. customers of Levi Strauss? Well, I was I was working with the the five hundred ones brand, which is the original Levi's uh, brand, you know, and and it has an amazing amount of heritage to it, and that's what we want today. We want brands that have a story to tell, and a company like Levi Strauss, of course, doesn't have to worry about that because they're sitting on hundreds or even thousands of these stories. Um, and so what I did was one of one of the things I did as part of my engagement with them was uh, uh, they were kind enough to give me access to letters and packages that people had sent to the company to headquarters in San Francisco over the past 150 years. And it, it was really fascinating to go through some of these letters that people had written talking about how these this humble pair of blue jeans, you know, this relatively inexpensive product had made such a huge impact in their lives. 
uh, whether it whether it uh, had saved them from injury. You know, they were working somewhere and some scalding water went on them, but the pants protected them. But there were also very sentimental stories. Uh, you know, I met my wife when I was wearing these jeans or we, <laughs> you know, I got engaged when I was wearing these jeans. And so there was a tremendous amount of really original material there straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And, you know, when it comes to consumer data, that's what you want. You know, you want the unfiltered stuff if you can get it. You can summarize it later, but it sure is helpful to look at what people are actually saying, not just reading a summary in a marketing research report. Yeah. How did you, how did you use that information? How did Levi's use that information once you learned it? Well, part of it was for for PR purposes to to publicize. We we were doing some also some surveys about about uh, blue jeans and how people felt about blue jeans. So it was kind of like color, if you will, that we could insert into these reports. Uh, but I think it also gave us some insights um, and and especially reminded the company that you know people aren't buying uh, a piece of fabric; they're buying a story. They're buying heritage. You know, they're, they're buying that brand and that brand is really playing an important role in their lives. And that's something that even a company like Levi's that, that knows pretty well how to do this, uh, it's good for them to be reminded and for all of us to be reminded that, that really our customers are, you know, they're all flesh and blood people and every one of them has a story to tell and your brand should be a part of that story. Yeah, that's great. You know, I like to call that customer intimacy because as a writer, it can be so difficult to just write generally. Like the more I can understand the customer and try to write directly to that person. So I agree with you. Even sometimes when maybe we read through all those letters, we don't use something specific from those letters. It does something in our minds and we get to understand that customer a little better in their own language and and speak to them better. So for me, I know you say here, uh, don't overlook unconventional sources of data. And I love that 150 year old letters and packages are are certainly unconventional. (laughs) But, uh, you know, today is, is, is even if you're in the pandemic and you're stuck working from home, I know something that's helped me a lot is reading customer review sites. Like if that's B2C, it might be Yelp or Google reviews or B2B, it might be, you know, G2 or Trustpilot or, or forums or LinkedIn, because hearing customers speak in their own words is so powerful. It's so powerful. It, do, do you have any other good unconventional source of data or? Well, you know, there's, I mean, but, Look, there, there's a lot of value in, in sending out surveys and questionnaires and so on, if you can get people to answer them these days. But, uh, you know, as you as you point out, you're you're not getting you're not getting it from the original source there. You're get, you're getting some analysts version or summary of that. And so whenever you can get out and see the real thing happening and when you talk about unconventional, you know, I mean, there are I, I have not personally done this, but. There are even people called garbologists, you know, who go through who go through <laughs> consumers' garbage and yeah. look to see what they're really throwing out, as opposed to what they're telling surveyors that that they're buying, you, you know. And uh, it doesn't get any more real than that. But you know, uh, I'm not saying go out and look through your neighbor's garbage by any means. But but as you say, you know, comb, combing through reviews, seeing because when consumers are posting this stuff they're not participating in a study. So they're not trying to be polite and please the interviewer and all that. You're getting the real thing here. Yeah, I agree. And I think also when they fill out a survey, I don't know what you think about this, but we're in a different frame of mind because we're being asked and kind of forced to reflect on a product. And so sometimes it's just kind of this unnatural feeling. You know, I know when, even when I filled out a survey versus if you were driven or motivated to write that letter or to post something on social media. That was just that human being's natural reaction to that product or that experience. Right. Yeah. I was taking, sorry, go on. No, I was just, I was just going to say the closer you get to the original source and not rely on that to be watered down or, or overanalyzed, the better you are, you know, and, but, but again, you can't just absorb one or two of those because then you have the representativeness problem, of course. And, you know, we've we've all been in situations, say, in a focus group where one really loud, domineering person has totally skewed the results. So we don't want to just base our findings, you know, our, uh, on one or two people. But to the extent that we can get in there and really, as you say, have some actual people in mind when we're developing our strategies and so on, that's very helpful. I think that's what's driving, you know, the big push today toward customer personas and, you know, creating this, this avatar or this ideal customer. 
And, and I think that can be very useful as long as we keep in mind that there's no such thing as one ideal customer, because even your ideal customer is actually several people. He or she is going throughout the day actually changing their identities. That's what I wrote my book about, The New Chameleons. Uh, we're all changing our identities all the time. And so even just having that one, quote, ideal customer in mind is probably not quite good enough these days. That's a good point, too. We're probably a different person at work than we are at home in the morning, than we are at night, on the weekend, than we are on vacation. I mean, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why, I, you know, you're starting to see some companies shifting towards when, when they, even when they organize their brand management, you know, internally, uh, some of them are reorganizing around, say, occasions. Like if you're a snack food company, some of the big snack food companies have done this. So, they no longer have a brand that they're organized around like Fritos. They're organized around an event like, say, tailgating. And, and that allows you to think about all the different products that play together in a tailgate or some other situation. That's great. That's what we would call also moving from company centricity. <laughs> like we've got these divisions and these brands to customer yeah. centricity, right? To having that, that customer idea. So, uh, yeah, one last thing I want to mention because you brought up a really good point of the loudest voice. I in a letter and a review and anything is another thing you can do is pair this with quantitative data. So a big challenge with quantitative data sometimes, either if we're looking at analytics or running an A-B test or sales figures. So you see this thing happen, but the biggest challenge is, well, why the heck did it happen? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you're trying to form a hypothesis of it and actually seeing how people are talking and help you like, okay, backfill, like maybe this makes sense here, you know, as opposed to relying on an outlier too. Yeah. You know, I, I like to tell my students that that a survey like that is very valuable because it tells us what we're looking at, but it doesn't tell us why we're looking at it. So yeah. you need both. Uh, it's not a question. Of, you know, a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I'm a qualitative guy or I'm a quantitative guy. Well, that's ridiculous. You know, then you're a hammer in search of a nail. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and that, that happens a lot. You know, people get trained in some technique and they want to, they want to use it for everything. And that's, that's not a good idea. You know, it's a, better idea if possible to triangulate by using multiple techniques and then you can start to see whether there's some consistency falling out there exactly all right well, let's take a look at your next story you talk you say interact as much as possible with real consumers when you're developing a new product which we kind of touched on but tell me how did you do that with black and decker where you were able to discover something the engineers didn't realize yeah we and and it was interesting uh we we followed um some housewives around as they were using a particular product that that the company made it was moderately successful but not really doing great and what we realized is that uh when we followed these uh housewives around and it's a product that cleans showers and things like that not not too sexy i would say but but effective um we realized that that uh they were they were having essentially to carry the product in two hands, uh, one one hand for the actual cleaner and one for a reservoir that held the cleaning fluid. And um, what we what we realized is that if we if we integrated the cleaning fluid into the main device, then that would free up a hand. It's, you know, this is not exactly a cure for cancer, but. Uh, but the engineers hadn't, it hadn't occurred to them because they were more focused on, you know, how do we deliver this liquid most efficiently in, into the cleaning surface? And so uh, by, by taking the customer's perspective and by actually listening to them talk out loud, if you will, as they're doing this task, we were able to come up with, with a small insight. Uh, they, they made that design change and, and the product wound up doing very, very well as a result. That's awesome. I mean, I've heard that called customer anthropology. But if you're listening and you've got a digital product, let's say you don't have a physical product and you're saying like, well, this wouldn't apply to me. Here's a great case study we did before with e-bags that was somewhat similar. You know, e-bags, they sell uh, luggage, they sell, uh, they were selling purses with this. And they were trying to understand how people were using, well, women really were using the app to buy, pur to buy purses. And so they went and they actually went in these women's homes and they were looking for purses. And they found that, you know, kind of the engineering mindset was, okay, how do we get people as quickly as possible to these purses? How do we make the search as efficient as possible to get them to the right purses? But that's not how women were shopping. It was like, 
after a long day, they put their kids to bed, they whip out their phone, they whip out the app, and they get a glass of wine maybe, and they're just kind of liking to browse and they're liking to look around. And so this insight, which is would be really hard to get digitally, like you mentioned, actually going and, and following people around in their homes, be really hard to get digitally by going in people's homes and seeing how they interacted, they were able to actually see this, you know, insight of maybe not, maybe the most efficient way to design this user experience isn't, isn't the best way. So, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I don't know if market researchers are having to wear masks when they go in people's homes these days, but <laughs> I doubt that's a very popular uh, research technique right, right about now. But, but you're right. I mean, even, even if you're in e-commerce, you're selling, y- your process is totally online. You, you can still, uh, you can still follow people and, and and see what they're doing and how they want to use how they want to use your product and you know your basic insight is look you know there's a lot more to shopping than buying yeah exactly yeah uh, and there's probably a lot more going on in their day than using your product too so you're seeing in that small moment how do they use it and what else is going on and how do they they get distracted yeah. so. and that what else is very very important I, that's been a that's been very important for me throughout my career is, is looking at adjacencies and looking at how people are incorporating these brands into a lifestyle that also involves the, the, the simultaneous use of other brands. And so by looking at, at what people are expecting to see in one category, given that they ha- have something in another, that kind of horizontal perspective is, is actually lacking I think in, in a lot of marketing strategies, but, but, uh, you know, people don't buy, buy a brand, you're selling them a brand, but they're buying something that fits into everything else they're doing all day. Right. And we're in our four walls or at home and in, in our virtual four walls, we're only thinking about our products. And, you know, something I've noticed too, in, in my career is it's the same for our marketing messages and our advertising messages. And so we created this like customer theory tool, because when I would, for example, if I was working on a, a video or, you know, an ad or something like that, I would experience it, you know, with like studio headphones, with like studio, you know, speakers with this, you know, massive, you're in the editor's suite where you have this nice catered lunch. And then you have this like massive screen where you see every detail and you've seen it 32 times when they edit it and you know every detail. And then you actually go out in the world and it's very disappointing where they were looking at on their phone, on a subway with crummy headphones where they're distracted or they're, you know, like their kid just stubbed their toe and is crying and this other thing is going on. And you don't realize how the, the thing that you're spending so much time on is such a sliver of their attention and their time. That's that's right. And we you know, look, we all have egos and we all believe that if it's important to us, it must be important to everybody else. So, you know, if you're if you're selling kitty litter, you're you're up all night wondering about the best brand of kitty litter and you figure, well, everybody else must be worrying about it, too. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, OK, this is a, this is a great one. I've, I've experienced this in my career, you know, often as as marketers, we're in a different uh, demographic persona, whatever you want to call it, than our customer. And, and how do you better understand them? And so you talk about getting frequent reality checks from your customers. So as an author of several textbooks, what have you learned in writing those textbooks? Because you get I, farther and farther away from that demographic, right? <laughs> as you go on in your yeah, career. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, you, you, you got it. I mean, I, I love to say every, every fall when I walk into my uh, classroom, um, I've aged, I've gotten one year older, but they haven't, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're still 20 and I'm not, you know? Um, so yeah, it, it does get uh, very difficult to, to keep that perspective. And, and, and so, um, you know, in, in many cases, our customers are, are dissimilar to ourselves. And yet we, we have trouble believing that. And there's even been research that's been done on brand managers that shows that, you know, as they're thinking about this persona or whatever, they're actually thinking about an ideal version of themselves. They assume their customer is a, is just a slightly better version of themselves. And that, that is often not the case. And, and I certainly, I certainly find that with writing textbooks. Uh, especially in a field like marketing. You know, if I was uh, writing a book on algebra, I probably wouldn't worry about it too much. But in marketing, obviously, uh, things change very, very, very quickly, way too quickly for most of us. And of course, for these young uh, students, you know, if something happened in 2019, that's ancient history. So there's this constant struggle to stay, you know, really current. 
And so uh, sometimes <laughs> what I find is when, I, you know, I'll say to a student, did this, did this example that I used make any sense to you? And they'll say, well, frankly, I didn't know what you were talking about, but I figured you must have had it. You must have meant well, so I went along with it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, mem- memories are short and uh, it's just so important to, to try to take your, your buyer's perspective, even if you're, say, uh, 50 years older than they are. Um, you know, the further away you are, the more important it is to check in with them frequently and say, have I got this right? You know, am I, am I at least close? And at the, on the other hand, making sure that you don't try to sound too much like somebody who you're not, you know, being a, let's say being a 60 year old copywriter, you know, writing an ad for 20 somethings and trying to sound like a 20 something is probably not a great idea. Yeah, the examples you used kind of blew my mind because you said the killing of bin Laden and 9-11. And, you know, I hadn't thought of it because 9-11 was such a big, I mean, I still remember exactly where I was on 9-11. My daughter <laughs> is a college freshman now, and I, I hadn't really thought about it, but she was born after 9-11. So, she, you know, that's such a different experience than what I had with it. Yeah, yeah. Some of the bedrock memories that we take for granted, you yeah. know, young people have well, I won't say they, they've never heard of 9-11, but they just know it was a really bad thing that they didn't have to deal with, you know? Yeah, they didn't experience it vividly like we did. We're remembering, you know, that I, that was my generation's probably Kennedy moment where, you know, it's like you yes. knew where you were when, when nothing happened. So uh, when, when, when I read this example from you, it got me thinking also of internal communications with, within a company because here's, here's an experience I faced. So, we, you know, with marketing, Sherpa, the great thing is we're, pretty influential in the marketing space. And so, but when you're in the actual building with these other people, you don't realize that that other person sitting next to you, you know, thousands of people are, are reading his articles. And so the, uh, I used in a company meeting, I thought this was just a brilliant analogy. Everyone's going to love this. I used a Jackson five and I talked about, you know, Hey, to the rest of the world, Michael Jackson was this amazing talent and he was, you know, but to like Randy or his brother, he was just the annoying little brother. And so when we're in this building together, you're like, Oh, that's whoever is annoying, you know, whatever. But out in the world, they're, they're actually some, and I look and I'm like, this is going to be huge. And, and I get a lot of blank stares because I realized a lot of the people in the company were younger than me and did, they didn't, had no idea what I was talking about. The Jackson, five. Michael Jackson was even ancient to them. They didn't, they didn't understand that. So mm-hmm. I love well, your example. I, I knew, you know, Daniel, I knew it was over for me when I, I, I was teaching an undergrad class and this was many, many years ago, actually, I mentioned the Beatles and, uh, this girl in the front row had this puzzled look on her face. And I said, the Beatles, you know, the Beatles. And she was, and she thought about it. And she said, Oh wait, wasn't that Paul McCartney's old band? <laughs> That's great. I said, Oh, I'm done here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, we talked about some of the things you made in your career in marketing, but the other key thing we do as marketers is we collaborate with people, right? No real marketer is, uh, works in a silo. So the first person you mentioned that you really collaborated with and learned from was John Greco, the chair and CEO of Marketing Impact Council currently, and I think he used to lead the DMA. So you learned from him the strength of weak ties. So tell us that story. What, what is the strength of weak ties? Yeah, well, that, that means, you know, that's, <clears throat> that's an expression that means that, um, that really we, we tend to focus on our strongest ties within a network, you know, the people we know, the people we work with, our clients, et cetera. Uh, those are our strong ties. But social scientists like to talk about the strength of weak ties as well. And these are the, these are the connections that you have to other people's networks. And so you can kind of, uh, you know, if, if you're working, collaborating with someone who has their, their own, like you were saying with other writers at Marketing Sherpa, you know, everybody's got their own kind of constellation of, of networks and so on. And there may be relatively little overlap between your network, which could be a very rich network, and somebody else's network. So by making that jump, be essentially gaining permission to get access to their network as well, you're you're suddenly catapulting yourself into an entirely new, I was going to say minefield, I don't think it's a minefield, but <laughs> an entirely new set of possibilities that you wouldn't have if you stuck with your own network, even though that network is quite strong. So it's always good to to uh, connect with with somebody who is very very active, but is not necessarily running in your circles. 
So these are, I, I forgot what book it was, but they call them the super influencers and the kind of super connector type of folks. And how did John Greco's network help you out in, in your career? Yeah, well, in this in this case, uh, as, as I mentioned, I'm I'm developing this this online course on on customer engagement, and and uh, John has an amazing network. He's had a long career uh, leading the Direct Marketing Association and 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 some other uh, big big organizations, and and so obviously, uh, many of the people that that he's had the the opportunity to interact with are not people that that I as a college professor would have encountered. So uh, it's tremendously valuable for me to be able to go up to one of John's contacts and say, you know, uh, this this is something you might be interested in. You normally wouldn't have heard about it, but because I know him, now I know you. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hesitate to say this because I, I get so many sales messages. But uh, when I started on LinkedIn, I used to be very, very rigid about only accepting people that I really had worked with and knew knew very well. And I read this article by Chris Brogan, who was just explaining, "Hey, look, LinkedIn works better if you just accept all connections. That's just how the mm-hmm. the platform works." And so, uh, a few weeks ago, I'd written a case study about uh, hiring practices and uh, uh, customer uh, employee retention practices of companies. And one of the sources was in I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. One of the sources was in Minnesota. And after you know we wrote the article, he connected with me, and he just it's funny. He reached out and he said, "Hey, I see you're in Jacksonville, and you're connected with so and so. Do you do you know them?" And we're, I had that's someone I happen to know socially. It's not even, you know, through marketing. It just happened to, you know, our kids, we go to the same synagogue. And so I just thought it was like, it just kind of not that I used it in any business way, but it blew my mind that this guy had written this article with it way out in Minnesota, also had a connection that I knew very well here in Jacksonville that I, that I knew socially. So if you yeah. are <laughs> in business development or sales and not sending out the spammy LinkedIn messages I get 20 times a day, maybe there's a constructive way to use that in your, uh, in your career. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm no LinkedIn expert. That's, that's for sure. But I, I've never quite understood this thing of when people block, you know, access. And I'm thinking, what do you think you're giving away? I mean, this is not an invitation to your daughter's wedding. I mean, this is just, a, <laughs> you know, it's just a click. So what, what is, what is so important about you that you can't share your connections? But I'm, I'm sure people have legitimate reasons. Like you say, you know, I, I don't receive, you know, 10,000 sales pitches a day, only maybe a thousand. So I, I'm not <laughs> in that category. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here, so here's your next uh, uh, example, Dr. Maleka Brengman. And feel free to correct me because I probably got that wrong. And I looked her, I think she's the associate professor of marketing right now at Re Universitat Brussels. Yes. And so you talk about finding collaborators with complementary skill sets. And I've definitely, this has helped me in my career. So how are you collaborating with Dr. Yeah. Bregman? Uh, we're actually, we're, we're in the early stages of a study looking at, at uh, robots and, and how they might be used in service settings. And uh, she, has a, she has a lot of background um, with that. And, and, and at her university in Brussels, there's a big robotics institute there. And so... Uh, this this is a great example where you know many of us might have you know seventy or eighty percent of the assets we need to do a project, but we're missing a few key pieces. And uh, you know it's just like a company that acquires another company f- to get technology that they needed. You know, think about acquiring collaborators and hopefully not a, ho- a hostile takeover, but uh, <laughs> you know, think about acquiring collaborators strategically to to plug the holes, you know, in, because none of us has 100 percent of the skills we need to do anything. I certainly don't. And so by looking for someone who has, let's say, statistical expertise or, or experience in a certain industry, um, you know, they're usually going to benefit from you as well. So it, it's, you know, we, there's that expression, no man is an island. And, and that's really true. You know, we can, we can try to do everything ourselves. And at some level, we don't want to delegate, you know, there's a happy medium. We don't want to delegate everything. But I, I really have found that, that nine times out of 10, you're better off admitting that you need some help and, and being proud of it, really being proud that you had the, you know, the foresight and, and, uh, you know, the, the ability to see that you had to plug some gaps. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being strategic. Yeah. It's funny. You talk about it in the corporate way, you know, how corporations talk about their core competency and what they're going to outsource. But right. you know what I've learned in my career, uh, 21 laws of leadership is a great course I took. I, f- I forgot the guy's name, but uh, one thing he talks about is people don't pay for average. 
and this idea that like you really need to you know there, there's some ideas of like you need to be well-rounded you need to be a renaissance marketer a renaissance man or woman and do everything and he's like no you need to find out what is your special skill and and just go all in on that and the other things you know work with other people on it because if you're going to be average at it you know it's not going to help you and so i know in my career like i know my skills writing storytelling content creation and when it has come to things like design to technology to all these other things like to your point it's like find someone who you can collaborate with who you can you know really rely on for that because i'm never going to be that good of a tech guy <laughs> it's just not going to happen so i got the computer on i got this recording set up that's enough <laughs> yeah and it's so. you know and and uh it's quite possible that tech guy can't write his way out of a paper bag and he needs you so right and that's that's that great teamwork that's that great collaboration which we're Talking about. So last person we want to mention you collaborated with, Jacqueline Liu. She's the executive director and global head of consumer and brand health practice, CI product leadership at Nielsen IQ. And you mentioned always be vigilant about updating assumptions. So how did Jacqueline help you update your own assumptions? Well, I recently worked with Nielsen to, uh, I directed a project to update their, their brand health model that they use for clients around the world. Uh, to help help them understand what their brand is, is, you know, the impact it's making on consumers, how consumers think about it, and and uh, working on this with a with a huge company like Nielsen was was really great because uh, obviously they are they're dealing with clients in just about every country in the world and and dealing with data from every country in the world. So a, as we look at something like brand health. You know, we, we have to recognize that, uh, of course, the, the same brand can have very different meanings and different profiles as we move around from market to market. And it, it's just so important to, to remember that. And when you, you know, when you're working with people, uh, you know, in a global company like Nielsen and you and you realize, you know what, they've been doing this, uh, this working from home stuff for a long time because they, you know, their teams are made up of people that are, you know, taken from uh, offices around the world. So in this case, uh, she was, she's based in Malaysia. Some of her team members were in Vietnam, in Austria, you know, it was just fascinating. Uh, and, but it, there, there really is, uh, some danger there of, you know, having this mindset that, well, I, I know the way it works in my country. How different could it be anywhere else? And, you know, most of us have had that eye-opening uh, moment where we, we realize that a brand that we've been involved with has a totally different profile in another country. And to to assume that you can just move from place to place with your, let's say, American-centric attitude is is really, really a mistake. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing I learned, too, in, internally – working with others because so I'm based here on the East coast and I'm originally from New York. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, the stereotype of people from that area are not, I don't know what the word is shy. <laughs> so when we're, you know, working on a project together, I have no problem sharing my thoughts and opinions and how we can improve it in these things. And kind of, I've learned over time, not only people from other countries, certainly when we've, um, work with people from Europe and Asia, they're d- definitely don't have that same kind of, uh, brashness to, uh, interacting, but even the Midwest, when, when we've worked with, you know, some folks from the Midwest, I've, I've had to learn to kind of like, okay, kind of dial it back a bit and really kind of really pull it out of them because they're not going to want to say anything negative about the project. They're not wa- wa- going to want to raise any red flags. They'll just kind of go along with, with the strongest voice in that meeting. And so really kind of being aware of those different cultural differences and letting them know it's okay <laughs> if you see any flaws in the project, let's know it now before it, you know, fails on the back end and just nod and like, yeah, that's kind of what I thought, but I didn't say anything. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a great rule. Always have at least one New Yorker on your research team. And so you, you can get to the facts quickly. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Here, so. All right. Well, this has been great, but your stories have been great. But before we go, what can you tell the audience? What is your advice to them about the key qualities of an effective marketer? Yeah, well, uh, sell lots of stuff. But uh, other than that, I'd say, uh, you know, the, I guess the key, and this won't surprise you based on our conversation, it is empathy. The key is being able to, you know, take yourself out of your your analyst or your brand manager persona and and to the extent that you can try to understand what you're selling from the point of view of the customer. And that that can be a tall order, of course, depending on on what the product is. But you know, always start with at least with the assumption that your frame of reference is not the same as your customers. If it turns out to be, then 
you know, no harm done, but it's likely that there's going to be some differences. So don't just sit in your office and assume that you you know how people will react to this latest promotion or whatever um, without testing it first. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, doing a uh, representative uh, survey with 2,000 respondents or something, but try to get some reality checks as you're going and don't wait until the end. You know, bring your customers into the process. I've written a lot about co-creation and the importance of collaborating with your customers because they often are your best salespeople and they often are your best product designers. Yeah, that's great. And one thing I would add too, it can be fun. You know, it, it is, while it's really hard to try to understand other people, it's really fun to to me to learn other things about them, to be curious about them and to work with them when they're really, you know, passionate and helping you create something. So yeah, marketing should be fun. Yeah. We're, we're, we're the fun part of business. That's why my students major in marketing. They don't want to have to do the, the hard work that the that the finance people do. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's why I major in marketing. So. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much for your time, Michael. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com. 